imagine if we could see how Switch's internals are used by developers to get the best results in games. From Doom to Mario Odyssey, from Hellblade to Smash Bros. Ultimate, there's an incredible variety of ways to get that Tegra X1 chipset to sing. Of course, no game uses it in exactly the same way, and so it'd be fascinating to see how each uses the CPU and GPU in tandem. Well, as luck would have it, a recent breakthrough in the Switch modding community makes this totally possible right now. Thanks to the work of modders named Massagrater and Werewolf, we now have the Tesla Switch Overlay mod, allowing you to display, well, all sorts of things on the left-hand side of the screen. Whether that's a list of cheats or controls for overclocking, you can show anything there while playing the game and even tinker with it as you play. But one fascinating way to use this overlay is to simply show the stats. This, at last, reveals what Switch is doing from frame to frame as we play these games. Every game is of course unique, and how hard the GPU or CPU are being stressed, the load on each isn't a given. With this overlay you can see the tricks developers use to adjust the clock speeds behind the scenes, often more flexibly than you'd first expect. So naturally my first pick for testing was a first party Nintendo game, Mario Odyssey. A quick note that all GPU and CPU settings are entirely set to the system's default here. That's 1020 MHz on the CPU and 768 MHz on the GPU while docked. So I kicked off with the Tostarina Ruins level, a wide sprawl of deserts with lots of detail on the horizon here. No mods added yet, but here's the magic. Pressing the left bumper, D-pad down and into the right stick, there, we have an overlay. And choosing status overlay, we have all the details we need. Yes, it is a bit on the large side, a bit wide, let's say. But all the stats are laid out neatly for us to see what's going on. CPU load, GPU load, thermals, and the way RAM allocation is divided up, all accounted for. There's actually a newer extra enhancement for this from Massagracer, adding a frame rate counter to this as well. Regardless, if you want these stats, there is a way to add them with mods. For all of this though, be advised that you do mod your Switch at your own risk. There's a lot of hoops to jump through to get this working, and so take caution if you are trying this yourself. Still, the results in Mario Odyssey are very revealing of the way Nintendo uses the hardware. Before we start, a quick side note. You'll see there's four CPU cores listed here, rather than the three we understand to be set aside for games. This is because Nintendo gives developers three cores to work with, while the so-called Core 3 on the list is reserved for the OS. In fact, it's on this last core that our overlay operates. Memory allocation for this is quite tight, which is a challenge for the mod community when it comes to doing anything too elaborate. Also, increasing the refresh on the stats can incur a slight performance penalty. The higher the tick rate, the more it can potentially encroach on in-game performance. As it is now, it's only a fractional difference, and we get accurate results from game to game. So, point number one, the so-called boost mode. As we reported last year, this amounts to optimizations in how select games use the CPU in particular to improve loading times. This is easy to demonstrate now we have an overlay in place. Consider this, when you die in Mario Odyssey, the screen fades to black and the game loads you back to the last checkpoint. There is a fairly quick turnaround in Odyssey admittedly, but that's no doubt made faster by this boost mode. Note the CPU stat once the screen goes black. The CPU gets boosted temporarily to 1785 MHz, a 73% increase on the stock clock. Meanwhile, our GPU actually drops all the way down to 76.8 MHz, a tenth of its usual speed. We see this trick used in plenty of titles. Zelda Breath of the Wild, Wolfenstein Youngblood, and even Crash Team Racing take advantage. What's happening then? Well, 1785 MHz is the technical max CPU frequency that Tegra X1 can run at, the same peak clock of the 2017 revision of the Nvidia Shield. It's simply impractical though for battery life and thermals for Switch to always hit this number, but spiking it upwards in crucial moments does help shorten a loading screen. And that's exactly what we're seeing. To balance out that extra load CPU side then, the GPU gets a rather sharp drop in frequency. 
Loading times are predicated on the CPU decompressing assets in the background, and with the screen mostly being blank, there's really no need to have the graphics processing running at full power anyway. At least not for this moment. At the first sign of gameplay, we go back to default clocks on both, but loading in Zelda does get a boost. Now, some games don't use this trick at all, I've noticed, which is a shame. Dark Souls, for instance. It's possibly because it predates the boost mode, but there's no sign of that CPU spike at all to speed things along. Which obviously would have been hugely useful given the trial and error nature of the gameplay. Also, Smash Bros. Ultimate only triggers boost mode after selecting the level, but not for the main loading screen after selecting your characters, which is the longer one. Still, in games like Zelda Breath of the Wild, it makes a big difference. Check this out. I'll use the sysclock mod to fix the CPU to 1020MHz to the right side of this comparison, which overrides the boost mode spike at 1785MHz we get normally on the left. This gives us an idea of how long it'll take to load without the fix. Side by side, the regular playback with a 1785MHz CPU spike for loading gets us from the main menu to the Great Plateau in 23.5 seconds. But without it, that's 30.3 seconds, so around 7 seconds saved thanks to smart allocation of the Tegra X1 resource by Nintendo. Oh, and this feature even applies in portable mode for all games. This takes us to the next point, how Nintendo's choice to add a new portable GPU clock profile takes effect in some games. Ok, so the max GPU clock while portable used to be 384MHz at best in most titles, or 50% of the docked frequency. But these days, exceptional games have the option to go a level higher. Mortal Kombat is of course a classic example. Excuse the missing frame rate overlay on this, we had to shoot this indirectly by camera to get the stats, but you get the idea. After the arena's loaded in, the GPU boosts to 460MHz from the opening cutscene to gameplay. It's an exceptionally high clock speed, and back at the menus we go back to 384 again on the GPU. All of this helps to keep it at 60fps, and it's not limited to what you'd call the most realistically styled games either. Mario Odyssey, for example, fixes the GPU at 460MHz as well. The strange part about this is, this new GPU profile doesn't work across the board. I mean, look at Hellblade Senua's Sacrifice played portably. You'd imagine for such a demanding game, it'd need every last trick in the book to run at a clear 30fps. Well, it turns out the game just sticks it out at the regular 384MHz regardless. And likewise for Link's Awakening, here we have a beautiful Unreal Engine 4 game that uses this exact same default GPU clock speed. You have to wonder, given this game can struggle to hold 60fps when moving between areas, with switches to 30fps, if a similar boost to Mario Odyssey could have smoothed things out. After all, overclocking the GPU side while docked does seem to iron all of this out, and even the game out at 60fps, so there is possibly potential mist here while portable, though that would come at the cost of battery life. Next, there's the point that some games use dynamic GPU clock speeds, again only in portable mode. Now, each title appears to take a different direction with this. So for example, Luigi's Mansion 3 switches between 307 and 384 MHz. Meanwhile, the likes of Doom and Wolfenstein Youngblood dynamically adjust from 307 right up to 460 MHz, depending on where and when it's needed. This is very likely down to a developer's discretion, but it does make sense given how variable load can be in these games. It's another sign that developers have to be conscious not to constantly hammer the GPU at the full 460, as with Mortal Kombat, and battery life has to be respected too. Interestingly, looking at the thermals while docked, Doom and Wolfenstein are generally the ones to get the fan speeds revving highest. And that kind of makes sense when you see the temperatures. In our air-conditioned office set at 22 degrees, these two take no time at all to push the PCB heat sensor to 60 degrees and to 55 degrees Celsius on the Tegra X1 SoC. All of this gets the fans moving at 47% speed max as well. 
Now, higher speeds are obviously possible, but with consistent test conditions, it's always these two that got the number highest, along with Luigi's Mansion 3 bizarrely, which does hit the same peaks in temps and fan speed. Given these are all technical powerhouse games, all of which hammer the CPU cores to the high 90% region, it does make sense. Equally, it does highlight the headroom we have for a overclock. That is, assuming we're avoiding boiling point 100 degree temps here. 60 degrees is still a pretty safe point. With that in mind, let's take a look at Smash Bros. Ultimate. At stock clocks, docked under a TV, it's surprising how 4 player battles keep everything well within bounds for CPU and GPU load. Items are on, and there's so much headroom left for all sorts of action to be added here. Smash attacks, assist trophies and more. Of course, we can force the situation a bit by selecting the most taxing stages and characters. In fact, selecting 8 Ice Climbers on the Fountain of Dreams stage remains a rare bottleneck for the game, dropping it well under 60 FPS. Here it is nonetheless, we're getting the final smash going puts it in the 40 FPS region. Temperatures aren't as high as Doom or Wolfenstein, but I suspect that's largely because the GPU is being underused in this case. It's more of a CPU bottlenecked game if anything, notably on Core Zero where it's peaking. The trick of course is to unleash an overclock, pushing the CPU up to 1785 MHz and running the GPU at 921 solves these drops entirely. And what's more, the temperatures are still only peaking at 60 degrees again. This seems like an extreme reaction to an extreme problem, and not advisable for most games. Max clocks can and will get the fan revving audibly to keep those high temperatures down. However, there is a more conservative and sensible overclock that works for day-to-day -day use. Our understanding is Nintendo has a developer overclock mode, which simply puts the CPU at 1220 MHz. Now this is used by devs in order to have an overhead for internal debugging tools, but the key here is it doesn't melt the battery for portable play. Nintendo would likely never consider another GPU overclock for consumers, but one like this for the CPU is more realistic. After all, it's only a small bump, about 20% over the regular speed, and for games like Smash, Doom, Wolfenstein or Luigi's Mansion 3, where CPUs are pressed to the high 90% region, it could solve some drops. Wolfenstein Youngblood in particular is a great test case for this because it does actually drop from the very first level. Check this out, standard clocks and CPU cores 0, 1 and 2 are all being hammered at 95%, with a hit down to 25 FPS as a result. Not ideal really, but that's all the doing of a clear bottleneck. So let's try this level again, only now with this developer style overclock. We have the option for 1224 MHz in the sysclock mod, so let's go with that and sure enough, it's not perfect but it alleviates a lot of the strain. All of those core percentages are now in the 80% region, GPU load meanwhile is maxing out at 100% as you'd expect of a game using dynamic resolution, as is the way for many Switch games. But it's that saving on the CPU side that means frame rates now more consistently hit 30 FPS. There is potential here. Nintendo, after all, has proven willing to change the clocks on Switch, as we've seen with the dynamic GPU speeds and the 460 MHz portable mode. It stands to reason that there could be more down the line, hopefully for the CPU this time. And why not? Evidence here suggests we could see a worthwhile boost to performance here. Either way, this overlay only highlights the work that Nintendo's put into squeezing the most from Switch to date. The CPU boost for loading times in Zelda, the increased GPU clocks in Mortal Kombat, and the dynamic GPU clocks in Doom and Beyond all show what a flexible device this really is. It's no wonder we see so many impossible ports tailored for the system right up to the recent Witcher 3. There's a lot more to come from the modding community on Switch, though again, it's all done at your own risk if you want to see it for yourself. The overlay in particular shines a light on how versatile this machine can be through a delicate balancing act between thermals, fan speed, GPU load and performance. And what's most remarkable is there is still room to get more out of it, given the headroom we're seeing on so many games. But that's about all from me today. 
If you did like this analysis, please feel free to like or subscribe, and don't forget to hit the bell to get notifications as any new video lands. To get a high quality version of this video, check out our Patreon at digitalfoundry.net, and to get in touch with me or the team, just use Twitter. But from me for now, thanks for watching.